Let's take a moment now to feel the holiness in this space. The holiness that we feel right now comes from the words of the prayers, the melodies, uh, and it comes from all of us just being present. Look around. Not everyone here knows one another. I want you to know, because I have gotten to know most of individuals in this room, what a wonderful, amazing group. And the holiness really comes out of that. So I'm going to talk tonight about the experience of awe. And we come here on our High Holy Days to feel that sense of awe. But I'm going to tell you some stories about places we go when we, we don't always expect it. Sometimes it comes out at us in very different ways. So my story begins this summer in an activity that I had avoided for all 15 years being here in western New York. I avoided it because it's not my favorite types of activity, and my family can attest. It is, you're, you're going you're gonna to laugh at this, but it is the Maid of the Mist. <laughs> How many of you have been on the Maid of the Mist before? Okay, yeah. Very popular attraction in Niagara Falls. Beautiful. You can go right next to the falls. They have the Canadian side. You feel like if you want to jump over to the other side, you can almost do it. I, I wonder, you know, do the Canadians, do they say, let's go, let's make a break for it. We'll go on the American uh, the American boat, uh, anyways. Um, so I, I, ne I never like these uh, boat rides, uh, and I, I try to avoid anything that has thrill in its name. Uh, so anything that travels over 100 miles per hour, dips, twists, or in any ways throws me off balance. I especially hate, hate rides that go like this. A good day at the amusement park is, one, I don't have to ride a single ride. <laughs> uh, and you might say a boat floating slowly down the Niagara River is not in the same boat, but you know, to me, not too different. But being a good sport, we had my in-laws in town this summer, I put on that blue poncho and I got on that boat side by side and I braced myself for the absolute worst. I closed my eyes and this is true, and I prayed. I prayed that I would not get nauseous. I prayed that I would not get a headache. I prayed that I would get safely back to shore as quickly as possible. Opening my eyes, I found something that I had not expected. The experience was not only enjoyable, but joyful. Getting closer and closer to one of the largest waterfalls in the world, it turns out, fills you with a sense of awe. And it is what our ancestors call yira, a moment of profound beauty. A few days later, watching that spectacular production of Romeo and Juliet in Shakespeare in the Park, how many of you had a chance to see that? It really was a wonderful, they modernized it, it was spectacular. But we were sitting off to the side, so we could kind of make out the action, but not, not so much. We were sitting there and uh, trying to pay attention to the show, and right above our heads, these Japanese lanterns came in like exotic birds burning overhead uh, over Delaware Park. It was the most beautiful thing. You could see the AKJ, the new beautiful museum in the background, and I felt this real sense of awe. What was it about those two moments that's so transformative? Transformative. Was it the experience itself or the surprise that went along with it? Do surprise and awe go hand in hand? And what role does awe or yira have in our lives? How many of you have experienced a moment of awe this day? This day, raise your hand. This week? This year, did it stay with you? Did you feel it changed you? Do you feel changed by it? The story of surprise and wonder is very familiar in our tradition. 
Throughout the Torah, there are moments that take our ancestors' breath away. Sometimes I imagine when I'm reading the text of the Torah that I'm watching a modern-day movie because that is how they actually saw the experience. They didn't have a way of uh, video cameras or displaying it, but they honestly felt that when they're describing it. They felt that sense of awe. We have that in the burning bush, crossing of the sea, of course, Mount Sinai. But for me, there is one that stands out above the rest, and it occurred on a quiet night in the middle of the Judean hills at a time when the fate of our people hung in the balance. Jacob, our patriarch, was fleeing for, for his life from his brother Esau, and Esau was a tough guy. Uh, he had stolen his inheritance and his birthrights, and he had every reason to get out of town, to get out of Dodge. Alone, confused, distraught, he was forced to sleep on a bed of rocks far from his home in Beersheba. I've done that outside of Masada, and it is not fun. Only a teenager, he had never been on his own. No doubt he was petrified. It is in this moment of despair that a true miracle occurs. The Torah tells us in Genesis chapter 28 that Jacob dreamed of a stairway that was set on the ground and its top reached to the sky, and messengers of God, angels, were going up and down on it. In the dream, God offers a blessing of future success for Jacob and for Jacob's people. And afterwards, Jacob feels a sense of profound protection and safety. All of his fears melt away. This is the moment that will propel him towards a new path, a path of righteousness, humility and appreciation. When he awoke, Jacob exclaimed the famous words, Yesh, here, Adonai b'makom hazeh v'lo yadati. Surely God was in this place, and I did not know it. I love that sense. He just, he, it, it, it feels like a real quote there. About this verse, the medieval commentary, Ibn Ezra, writes, there are places where miracles are seen. I cannot not explain why that is, because it is, a, it is a deep mystery. According to Judaism, yira, wonder or awe, is absolutely essential to what it means to be human in the world. As the psalmist tells us, reshit chokhmah yirat adonai, the start of wisdom is awe of heaven. Experiencing awe is especially important here during the High Holy Days. What are the High Holy Days? Yamim no ra'im, the days of awe. But for most of us here in 2023, or our new Jewish year, 5784, awe is getting harder and harder to come by. Not because it isn't present, because it is always present. I, feel, I felt this particularly this past summer, when the latest picture from the James Webb telescope came out, a close-up of the, and forgive me, I'm mispronouncing a star, the Rho Apichu Cloud Complex. Walter, you'll have to help me with that one. <laughs> the closest star-forming region to Earth. In it, a mass of textured yellow gas floats like a jellyfish between bright red splotches and bright bursts of white starlight. Like so many of the other images from Webb Telescope, it is space unlike anything we have seen before. But this is not the only thing that actually occurred on that particular week. On the same week, scientists in Japan took real steps towards growing babies in a laboratory using the DNA of two male rodents, a true miracle. Scientists at Purdue University developed a new super white acrylic paint that can reflect 95% of sunlight, something that can be very useful in cooling our streets. And in a project funded by Caledon Oceanic, scientists use baited robotic cameras to capture, I love that, baited robotic cameras to capture young snailfish 8,300 meters below the surface of the Pacific o Ocean, the deepest life ever discovered. Amazingly awesome, right? But not one of these moments of year on, not one of them made the back page, let alone the front page of the Buffalo News or any other major media site. 
Discoveries that would have awed anyone a decade or two ago now barely make a mark on our consciousness. After years of making these amazing big budget movies, increasingly more sophisticated smart devices, chat GPT, and 450, this is what my children tell me, 450 foot roller coasters, have we become immune to wonder? What has happened to us? Where is our sense of awe and splendor? With so many wonders occurring around us all the time, how can we truly take time to acknowledge what is happening? How do we find wonder in this age of wonders? According to Professor Dacher Keltner from the University of California, these moments when we experience our awe are critical to our well-being as human beings. In his book, Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life, he explains all of the many health benefits of awe. And this is amazing. Awe calms down our nervous system and triggers the release of oxycontin, the love hormone that promotes trust and bonding. Awe activates the vagal nerves, clusters of neurons in the spinal cord that regulate various bodily functions and slow our heart rate, relieves digestions, and deepens our breath. Awe quiets negative self-talk, deactivating the default mode network, the part of the cortex involving how we perceive ourselves. And awe frees us of the pangs of narcissism, self-shame, criticism, and entitlement that often color our world today. To discover these insights, this is kind of cool, Dr. Keltner started by studying inmates at San Quentin State Prison in California, one of the largest and most hostile environments in America. He asked these prisoners where they found awe. What an interesting question to ask prisoners. They spoke about finding it in the air, the light, the imagined sound of a child. That's kind of heartbreaking, the imagined sound of a child, reading and spiritual practice. Teaming up later with researchers in America and China, uh, they tried to record people's re experiences of awe in journals. They found that on average, people have, how much would you guess? One, how, how, many, uh, how many times do you think you experience awe in a year? Do you think you experience it 10 times, 20 times, 30 times? What do you think, higher? 100 to 150 times, an average of twice a week. Uh, yet despite these profusion of these types of experiences, we rarely take them in. How do we truly harness the power of these moments of awe? Professor Keltner suggests four things, and these are really good guides. First, just pay attention. Noting what is happening around us and maybe marking our moments of awe in a journal makes a big difference. Now, this happens in our household a lot because my, my wife is here. She loves the stars and the moon. And believe me, she'll say, it'll be in the middle of the night, you know, like right before we go to bed, and she'll say, Alex, you have to come out. The moon is amazing. I'll be like, come on, I want to go to bed. <laughs> And sure enough, she'll drag me outside, and the moon will be amazing. And she always has me look for Mars, actually. Number two, focus on the goodness we see not in ourselves. And I love this. But in others. Focus on the goodness in others. That's how we find awe. Professor Keltner tells us that when we see others doing small gestures, like walking an, an older person across the street, we start feeling better and are also more able to perform meets vote good deeds. He suggests writing down quotes we like or holding on to stories that have inspired us. I love that, that we, it's because we watch one another that helps us. Number three, and this is important for Musar, cultivate a practice of mindfulness. This could be structured activities like yoga, meditation, Musar, or it could be just taking a walk. My friend and colleague, Rabbi Malka Bina Klein, goes on what she calls beauty walks. Now, she took me on one uh, earlier this year. She was feeling the after effects of the pandemic in this frantic and harried world we live in. One day she went out and looked at the flowers in the Wissahickon Park uh, near her home, watching them bloom before her eyes. 
she started taking photos of, of these, uh, of these uh, flowers, cropping them with an eye for what delights, and then texting them as a way of communicating love and comfort. And she sent them uh, as a Rosh Hashanah card to me. And lastly, choosing an unfamiliar path. Surprise. Awe, Professor Keltner uh, tells us, comes from novelty. Doing something new can open our mind and increase our sense of the divine. Those of you here for the first time, this is something that's new. You're pushing yourself. So take a moment right now. Think of something truly awesome that you experienced this past year and share it with the person next to you. So take a moment uh, to do that. Come on, go talk amongst yourself. I love, I love hearing all the conversation. It's <laughs> wonderful. You know, you get Jews talking. <laughs> so I want you to continue to share these stories. And Nancy McGorry in our office, she prepared two boards outside the sanctuary that have the quote from Jacob. Uh, Surely God was in this place and I did not know it. Find time over the course of High Holidays, write your experience on, on a sticky note, and we're going to put them on those two boards and take a look at them. See if they're some of the same experiences that other people, that you've had the same experiences. Let these moments of awe fuel our year ahead, shining like these Japanese light lanterns on the sky overhead, spraying us like water on Niagara Falls. This year, let us not only find those moments, let us savor those moments. These are the moments that transform our ordinary lives into extraordinary ones. I close with a poem by Rachel Bluestein, dif different spelling, <laughs> uh, called Tiny Joys. Tiny joys, joys like a lizard's tail, a sudden sea between two city buildings in the west, Windows glittering in the setting sun, everything blessed, everything blessed, a consoling music in everything, in everything, mysteries and hints, in everything waiting for quarrels of beautiful words to be strung by the imagination on its string. A good sweet year, a Shana Tova Umetuka. <laughs>